Okay, welcome folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. We are back working on S3. We do not, again, physically have the bill. We're doing a drive-by and it's on section five and section six. And this morning we're really focusing on section six, which deals with the working group for forensic care. And we have Deputy Commissioner of Mental Health with us, Morning Fox, as well as the Commissioner of uh, I was going to say BGS. It's not BGS, it's corrections. <laughs> BGS might be easier. Um, I, I don't need that title. No. <laughs> uh, Jim Baker. And then, of course, we have the legal counsel for DMH, Karen Barber here. Um, we'd like to start with Deputy Commissioner Fox. And I know that Deputy Commissioner Fox was upstairs in House Health Care yesterday. Quite a bit of testimony was given yesterday um, on section six. And I, I know we've only got an hour, so I'm just gonna sort of jumpstart it in terms of some of the testimony we received yesterday um, was really saying we should be looking at competency and the issue of, of competence, competency uh, restoration and how is that best achieved and is that best achieved in an actual building of a forensic facility, or are there other ways of approaching this? And that was part of the conversation that occurred upstairs in healthcare committee. Uh, the language that's in S3 really seems like there's already been a predetermined decision made to go ahead with a facility. And I think that piece really needs to be cleared up. Um, and that was the concern in healthcare committee and the deputy commissioner yesterday of mental health really clarified that. So if we could start at that point sure. morning, that would be terrific. So if you could just identify yourself for the record. For the record, morning Fox, deputy commissioner, department of mental health. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the committee and thank you, madam chair for uh, setting the table for today's testimony. Uh, I did spend uh, quite a bit of time with House Healthcare yesterday in discussing this section uh, of the bill. Uh, and there are some concerns around uh, some of the, the language in the study uh, for the forensic work group in section six uh, that could lead one to think that there's, there's either uh, some predetermination uh, of, uh, of, of findings and uh, we want to make sure, because this work is extremely important, that we want, want it to be really clear that uh, we're looking at any and all uh, pieces in this and that we're not having a predetermined uh, decision on whether or not uh, we need to look at a certain facility or a certain type of competency restoration program or something of that sort. Uh, and so we discussed some of that type of language. Uh, in section one of the uh, work group, uh, it uh, envisions uh, taking a look at uh, uh, other post adjudication uh, type findings like guilty but mentally ill. Uh, and then also it then gets into uh, looking at uh, different models that other states use, and it gives an example of the Psychiatric Security Review Board, um, uh, including Connecticut's Psychiatric Security Review Board. Uh, and we discussed removing that language, uh, which we're uh, fine with at the department. Uh, that will probably be one of the pieces that we do look at, um, and really the, the genesis of how that came into the bill originally was during testimony in the Senate side uh, in talking about different types of models. And it was just discussed in Senate in part of testimony that one of the types of models we would look at was this one example. Uh, and so somehow that basically was then put into the language as, you know, you'll look at things like that. Um, but by, by naming it as such, that could lend credence to its its credibility or its usefulness in Vermont more than uh, just by looking at any and every model in general. Uh, and so we're completely fine with removing that that language. Um, 
The other uh, piece similar to that is in section two, uh, where section two envisions that uh, we would evaluate various models for the establishment of a state forensic treatment facility for individuals found incompetent stand trial or adjudicated not guilty by reason sanity, and it shall address the need for a, a forensic treatment facility uh, in Vermont. And by having written that way with that language, it again seems to, one could interpret that as being in, indicative of saying, we should have one. And so take a look at, at what that looks like. And we really think that it needs to be looked at in a fashion that's more whether or not, you know, whether we need this. Um, and then if so, B, C, D, and E of section two uh, would then come into play. Uh, part of the testimony from both myself and uh, Dr. Raven from the Vermont Medical Society yesterday uh, spoke about various competency restoration models and that for a number of individuals, uh, competency restoration uh, happens in the community. And so when we start talking about competency restoration and happening in the community, it does bring up the question of, you know, how much and, and the impacts of, of the need for, uh, you know, a, a facility of this sort. Uh, and so that's kind of the genesis of becoming concerned around how that language looks. And we're in support of amending that language. I believe House Healthcare was working on an amendment uh, to, to craft that language, uh, but that it would basically say whether there is a need for a, for, you know, that, you know, that would be the study is that whether there's a need. And then if so, that's when we start to look at the entity or entities that would operate it, the feasibility and appropriateness of repurposing facilities, et cetera, et cetera, number of beds, fiscal impact, uh, et cetera. Okay, um, this might be a good stopping point for questions for folks. Any questions? I believe the committee's so quiet. They're not awake yet. I was gonna say, should I have brought coffee? Oh, yeah. well, my internet connection's unstable. Did folks hear it? Okay, um, so we have a couple of questions. Kurt and then Sarah. Um, I would like to get straightened out a little bit on the, as the sequence of events that we heard uh, some testimony yesterday as to how this actually goes through the court system. And so I'm trying to figure out um, a person is going to be, uh, is going to stand trial. So, and they find there's a preliminary screening. And if that preliminary screening or question finds out that the person is, says that this person may be, or do they actually determine at that point that the person is incompetent to stand trial and needs to have his competency restored. And then there is another, at which point, somewhere along the line, they decide whether that can be done in an institution or whether in a hospital or whether it can go into the community, um, depending on what needs to be done, I guess. So I just like a, a refresher on exactly the steps that take as to where that comp competency restoration is done um, and whether it can be done in a community setting or whether it has to be in a hospital. Sure, Does that... uh, great, great question, uh, Representative Taylor. Uh, and this is, I, I hope to be able to lay this out uh, fairly succinctly for you. Uh, so generally someone presents to court and really at any time that someone comes into court, uh, a request could be made uh, if there's a question of, of an individual's competency. Uh, and so the usual uh, kind of course of events is someone comes to their arraignment uh, and someone, state's attorney, defense attorney, judge, someone has question as to whether or not they can work effectively with, the, with their attorney. Uh, in other words, they, they start to question whether or not the person is competent uh, to, to uh, engage in their own defense. Uh, and so the request comes from the court uh, to our designated agencies uh, to have a qualified mental health professional come in and screen the individual. That screening, what they, what they do, they're screening to determine, to make, 
to, to give an opinion to the court as to whether or not they're recommending um, if, the, if the individual should have a inpatient evaluation, an outpatient evaluation, or that they're not seeing an indication right now for any evaluation. Um, and so there's no determination at that time around the individual's competence to stand trial. Uh, the screener is really just making the opinion to the court and the recommendation to the court as to whether or not that evaluation that they're, that they're considering, if it should occur outpatient, which could be in the community or in Department of Corrections or inpatient, which would be in a uh, psychiatric uh, setting. If the court does then order an inpatient evaluation, the next step in that process is that they're assessed by a psychiatrist uh, uh, at, at the, uh, through the Department of Mental Health, uh, that through our contract with our psychiatrists that work at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, they will then uh, have a further assessment of that individual and they will assess whether or not that individual at this time meets hospital level of care criteria. In other words, from a psychiatric perspective, does that individual meet criteria for needing uh, inpatient hospitalization to treat their psychiatric illness? If the psychiatrist concurs and says, yes, this person meets that level of care, then the uh, admission process will begin from there uh, to, a, to a psychiatric unit and their evaluation will occur as an inpatient uh, at a psychiatric facility. If the psychiatrist determines at that time that the person does not need to be in the hospital uh, and does not meet hospital level of care criteria, then that order will convert to an outpatient evaluation. And then not to get too into the weeds, but basically if that individual does not have bail set, they will be released into the community uh, based on their conditions of release from the court because the court will set conditions of release uh, uh, at the end of that, that arraignment. And so the person would then be, uh, you know, would be allowed into the community based on those conditions of release and would have their evaluation done on an outpatient basis, uh, meeting with an evaluator in the community. If there's bail that is set for the individual, uh, then depending on their ability to pay for bail, uh, that individual would either uh, have their outpatient evaluation completed in the community or uh, at a Department of Corrections facility. Um, the, the way that you've just described it, I believe it sounds like about three different evaluations. The first one done by at the court level by um, the designated age, agency, the second one done if the person might go to a uh, the psych hospital to be evaluated. And then you said at that point that he's the person is evaluated for whether they go into the community or they go into the hospital. So there's there's really. I don't want to get into too many things, but assessments and, and evaluations. So you have the the screener who assesses, I believe that this individual's evaluation that the court is requesting should happen in a hospital. And then to confirm whether or not that evaluation should happen in the hospital, the psychiatrist will see them. Uh, the psychiatrist in the concerns. hospital. Okay. Um, no, generally they'll be seen uh, in in either at court or in an emergency room uh, through telemedicine. Uh, okay. Uh, it is also possible that they could go to a, a straight from court to corrections uh, if there's no bed available uh, and there's bail. They would go to corrections where we'd still have. The, the state, our, our psychiatrist, uh, see them to determine should they come into a hospital for the actual competency evaluation. I so, see. So there's really just, there's really, there are three, but one is, the first one is, and it's similar to uh, an emergency exam when you involuntarily hospitalize someone civilly, you know, without the criminal court, you have the screener and the doctor, you know, you have to have multiple parties agree that someone needs to be kind of involuntarily hospitalized. Similar in this sense, you have to have the screener and the psychiatrist agree that this person's evaluation, that their needs are, are at such a level that they require hospitalization for it. Uh, now, wait a minute, you said that they go, they, they would then, let's say that the, the uh, psych evaluator says, uh, this person needs to be in a hospital to be evaluated. 
they still haven't determined that that person is incompetent. No, no, no. Okay, so then that, it goes. Then it go, goes to the hospital. At the hospital, is it still yet to be determined whether that person's competency to be is to be restored in the hospital or in the community? So a couple of things. Uh, if the psychiatrist agrees, yes, this person needs to be in the hospital. They'll be admitted to the hospital where the forensic evaluator outside of the department will come in and evaluate the individual to actually do the competency evaluation. So oh, they'll be admitted okay. to the hospital and then it will be days later until the forensic evaluator comes in to actually do the competency evaluation as to whether or not the person is competent to stand trial or incompetent. And just to be clear, Vermont does not have a competency restoration program. Uh, okay. And so, you know, we rely on the natural course of psychiatric treatment um, that may influence an individual's ability to, be, to become competent. Uh, many, many, many states actually have formalized competency restoration programs. And depending on the programs that you look at, between 60 and 80% of individuals who go through a formalized competency restoration program are able to regain competence. Uh, it's a much lower number in Vermont. Uh, it's much less frequent in Vermont where an individual is found incompetent to stand trial that they then regain competence and continue on in, uh, uh, in the criminal justice uh, system. So it, it sounds to me like what we need is for that psych evaluator in the hospital to, to determine this person is, if, the per, if that person determines that this person is uh, incompetent to stand trial, at that point, we should be able to say, this person needs to go to either, and I realize these programs don't exist, as you just said, but this person needs his, his competency restored, and it can be done in a hospital or it can be done in a community. And because of right. the severity of the mental health issues, we think it can be done in the, I think it can be done in the community, send them to a community one. If the mental health issues are so bad that uh, the, there's the incompetency, but there's also some mental health problems, then it would be restored in the hospital. That's basically correct, yes. Okay, good, very, very well, thank you. And you did very well, it is See, not, right it is not an easy uh, system. Uh, I, I've tried to describe this to people who work in our system, and it's very complex, and there's a lot of ifs and maybes. Um, I so wish I had a diagram with arrows is all. That's, I, okay. I might actually have, have one that we put together a couple years ago. I'll see if I can find that for you. That, that would be very helpful, especially if it's brought up to date and if, it is, if it's out of. Thank you. That would be good. So that whole issue is where we're in limbo. The folks are in limbo right now because if they've been deemed incompetent to stand trial, then we don't have a restoration program. So they're dealt with maybe to stabilize and then do they stay at the state hospital or if there's bail set, do they then stay at a DOC facility? or are they released into the community without the appropriate support systems? So that's the crux of the issue that needs to be dealt with before you, you say we're gonna do a forensic unit. Doing a forensic unit kind of has the cart before the horse. Correct. So you really need to look at where the gaps are in our current system, figure out what those gaps are, and then figure out how to establish a program or a process to restore comp competency and fill in those gaps. And then you figure out, do you really need a forensic unit or not? Right. And part of, part of the conversation in health healthcare uh, was also uh, one representative brought up, They're, they felt concerned that an individual who's been found incompetent to stand trial uh, has mental health uh, uh, issues going on is restored to competency and then may be found guilty and, and you know going into corrections that they felt concerned that an individual like that should be in corrections. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that led to a conversation of uh, another piece in this that we need to study, uh, which is a part of the forensic study work group, 
which is that there are other posted, you know, there are other potential adjudications that uh, about 25% roughly uh, of states, I haven't checked in a couple of years, but that other states have uh, a finding of guilty but mentally ill. Um, currently, Vermont has incompetent to stand trial and not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, and many states have what's called guilty but mentally ill. And the basic difference between guilty but mentally ill and not guilty by reason of insanity is that in the not guilty by reason of insanity, the basic premise is that as a result of your mental illness or you know, as the statute actually reads, mental disease or defect, which could also include people with intellectual disabilities, traumatic brain injuries, et cetera. But just sticking on the, the mental health end for a minute is that because of their mental illness, they were not able to appreciate that what they were doing is a crime or they were not able to, uh, to kind of modify their behavior uh, such as that they wouldn't commit a crime and that it was because of their mental illness that they were, in, were not able to do those things. Whereas guilty but mentally ill would acknowledge that an individual had a mental illness, uh, but that it did not have such a severe impact on their reasoning as to not know that what they were doing was a crime uh, or that they could have uh, modified their behavior. And the way states have enacted that is that individuals who are found guilty but mentally ill um, are served in either a forensic facility or in corrections um, in, depending on the state, but they would have special dispensation and special uh, uh, kind of status within corrections because of their mental health needs uh, and such like that. And so, again, that's something that we need to look at as part of our study. Is that something that would be useful? Is that something that fits in for Vermont and the philosophies of, of Vermont and how we operate here as a state? So we have a couple more questions. Uh, Karen, Sarah, I saw your hand, okay. And then Michelle, I saw your hand was up and it went down. So you still, okay. Don't know yet. Um, so we'll start with Karen. Yes, uh, thank you for this. This is very helpful to see how the scope of the work group is being further refined. And um, yeah, it just is very complex with the mental health system, criminal justice, having these things intersect like they're just, just complicated. Um, and so with that, I was wondering if there was any discussion yesterday too about the timeline for the work group. <laughs> yes. Seems like it's a lot to get in there. Okay. Um, if there was discussion we'll on there. That, and I, can I ask that question now or no? I'm fine. Um, it's fine. I just want to make sure everyone else has had the opportunity to ask a question before we get into the next section because the timeline does change drastically. Okay. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, so I just wanted to follow up a little bit with the, the comment Morning Fox just made about um, what was said in healthcare, where, you know, does it make sense if you have somebody who's got a mental health issue that they end up getting restored to competency in order to serve a long sentence in corrections? Like, is that is that the most appropriate setting for somebody? And it, it makes me wonder, in terms of this study group, um, it also brings back something that was said yesterday by the Defender General, where he was talking about a man who was judged competent, and yet he clearly was in psychosis and having really dramatic mental health challenges while he was in the courtroom. And so what does it mean if, comp if, the, le if the bar for competency is so low that you can be having active psychosis and you're still judged as ready to stand trial because you know that you're in a courtroom, it feels like maybe we're not really serving individuals that well or the community for that matter, because having a mental health diagnosis shouldn't, shouldn't equal as soon as you're well enough, we send you to prison. So I guess I just, I, my thought would be in relation to this particular um, piece of legislation we're looking at. I hope that the working group is able to look at many areas related to people who are having mental health challenges who end up uh, intertwined with the criminal justice system, and how could we best serve those individuals as well as our community? 
Yeah, and I and I I appreciate those comments, and I I uh, I do believe that that's that is a part of the function of this work group. Uh, it, and you know, when we look at talking about you know the potential of a let's say a forensic facility, um, you know, that's what what who what type of individuals uh, would go there? Um, you know, could people who have been found competent but are still struggling? be there as opposed to awaiting trial and corrections, you know, all those types of pieces uh, need to look at. Uh, and, you know, the, the other piece with competency is that it ebbs and flows. Um, you know, I've worked in the field of forensics uh, for about six or seven years in, in another state running maximum security units of a forensic facility. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen individuals who are found incompetent, restored to competency, then become incompetent again, then are restored to competency, then become incompetent, you know, and it can really ebb and flow with the course of someone's illness, with their, the course of their treatment, uh, you know, things of that sort. Um, and so I would truly hope in, in my world, I would truly hope that if someone is presenting as kind of as described by, you know, what you're describing from the Defender General, that someone would have hit the pause button to say, I don't, I don't think they're competent anymore and to request a, a new evaluation because uh, that can happen on an ongoing basis uh, and such. And then there's different conversations that happen too for individuals who have been found incompetent to stand trial and have been restored to competency, how to work with them, whether at a hospital and deciding, should we keep them at a hospital so that we can help them to maintain their competence? Uh, versus you know them going back to maybe corrections where they may start to refuse medication and the the stress of being in a correctional facility you know can have an impact on their mental health and well-being and i think all those types of things need to be considered when we look at do we need a a, a forensic facility and if so what type of individuals would be would be housed there uh, you know i i personally see restoration of competence as a civil rights issue uh, you know, these are people who have been uh, charged with a crime, but not proven to have done it. Uh, and so I think it's a civil rights issue that they have a right to face their accuser and to put on their own defense. Uh, and that we shouldn't uh, make the assumption that when they become competent, that's solely so we so that an individual can serve a sentence in, in corrections. I look at it as individuals should should be restored to competence as best as we can help them to do that so that they can have their day in court. They have the right to have a defense and to be potentially found guilty, be found not guilty, to put on a, a sanity defense. That is up to them, but it's a civil rights issue. And I think the victims also uh, uh, of crimes would want to ensure that the person, the person who actually perpetrated uh, uh, the, 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 the offense uh, is the one that's held responsible. And just because a person is to have alleged to have done something doesn't mean they actually did it. And, and so I, I see it as a civil rights issue because if we have someone who's alleged to have done it and they're found incompetent to stand trial, no, no disrespect to you know, the, the other, the, my brothers and sisters in public safety, um, but if someone's been charged with, with an offense, no one's looking for another person that may have committed that crime. People believe they have someone, they've charged someone, and they're being held as incompetent to stand trial. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to really try and help people be restored to competence so that they do have the ability to face their accusers and put on a defense, whether it's, again, whether they're found guilty, not guilty, put on a, a sanity defense is up to them. But I think it's incumbent upon us to try and uh, allow them to have that say. Okay, um, so morning, let's transition to the next part, which is the time frame and the recommendations that were given there. So and this may answer some of Karen's questions here, because I know a lot of that sure. has started to change as well. Sure. Um, so just because of kind of the, the large number of, of individuals who have interest and or uh, uh, a stake in these various conversations. Uh, it's, it's a fairly large and fairly unwieldy group 
um, to try and accomplish things. Uh, and so some of the discussion that we had in house healthcare was to look at staggering some of this and not having it as one large uh, work group and basically trying to stagger how we report out on the various pieces uh, and allowing the department to have some flexibility as to uh, the members of, of, of the work. Uh, but basically what we, what we put forward was that um, on section one, which is around identifying uh, the, uh, the gaps in the current mental health and criminal justice system structure, improve public safety, coordination of treatment of individuals, uh, review competency restoration models, uh, that we would report out to the legislature on that by uh, February of 2022. Uh, and then we would report out on section two, but primarily section 2A, which is whether or not there is a need for a forensic treatment facility uh, by July of 2022. And then we would then present uh, a complete and full report to the legislature uh, that encompasses all three sections by January 1 of 2023. January 1, 2023, so that, okay, I'm just trying to get the timeline here. So the first one would be in February of next year, which then if you want to put a program or a process in place, right? That would be the report that this is, these are the gaps in the current system. Right, and, uh, and really kind of what kind of competency restoration programs are we looking at will help inform the next question of whether or not there's a need for uh, um, a forensic facility. And that would come during the summer which is an election year. <laughs> so no, I'm just thinking it through in terms of a legislative process. So next year, next January, we find out where the gaps are and maybe put some initiatives in place to, to plug those gaps in a very simple terms is what I'm thinking. And then in, in the summer of next year <clears throat> would be the report on how you carry that out if you needed a certain type of facility or unit. <clears throat> so the legislature wouldn't be doing any work on that. It just would be, this is the lay of the land at this point. And then on um, January 1st, the beginning of a brand new biennium with brand new people and brand new committee makeups would be the final report that kind of coordinates all of that. Right. And so it would have uh, the recommendations around competency restoration programs, the, the description and, and commentary around the gaps in our system, uh, whether or not we need a facility, if that answer happened to be, yes, the, the, the work group felt that there was a need, then it would go into what that would look like, how it's operated, who operates it, you know, things of that sort. And it would also include uh, the order of non-hospitalization notification piece uh, as to whether or not that should be uh, placed in legislation and if so, uh, how it would be operationalized. So this is what you discussed upstairs in healthcare. And yes. this is the path that we're headed down. Is that what you're, okay. That's my hope, yeah. So, yeah, okay. So Karen, does that answer your question? Would you, is there more? Um, I guess that the, I, and I don't know if this is necessary or not, but I'm curious because this is a big shift from where it was in the Senate. And I know it's because there's been more conversation and thought on it. Like, how is it going to be received by the Senate? Is it switching from the goals? And I know there's also a lot of history with this bill and I'm the new person. So I'm just curious, you know, what's the significance of this? Is there going to be pushback on this or is this, we're all in a good place? Morning, I don't know if you can answer that one. <laughs> That's part of the legislative process. I, I, okay. So that would be yeah, the next I, step. I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of conversations yeah. happening. 
I think in the end, though, I, I would say that the actual goals and what we're doing with the forensic work group, that hasn't really substantively changed. Uh, you know, I think removing, removing the specificity of, you know, the Connecticut Psychiatric Review Board, for example, that doesn't change uh, really the, the content and nature of what we're going to be reviewing. Um, and, uh, you know, what was originally proposed, a, an August to November timeline, um, you know, I said this to House Healthcare, I don't know if I said this here, but it's like, basically, if folks want to receive a, a report just for having a report, um, then we can do that in, that in that kind of a timeline. But if we really want something that's going to be substantive uh, and really make strong recommendations uh, and even, uh, you know, it even posits, you know, uh, what type of statutory language uh, might be needed uh, and those types of recommendations. If we really want to have something um, that's going to have a positive impact on our overall systems, because these are two large systems, the criminal justice system, uh, you're, talking, you're talking the judiciary, uh, you're talking Department of Corrections and you're talking mental health system. So these are actually three very large systems that uh, are very interwoven at this. And it really is incumbent upon us to do this work well, uh, and it just can't be done in a short time. Um, and uh, as I said, many of these things I really see as, as uh, uh, civil rights issues. Uh, for individuals, and you know, I I fear that as many civil rights issues are are um, being having light shed upon them in this day and age, um, anyone who knows me knows I have talked about these types of civil rights issues for most of my adult life, and I fear that the civil rights issues of people with mental illnesses uh, is not not having that light shed upon it. And I think it's really important and incumbent upon this work group to be able to do that and do it right. Are there other questions? So all, all of everything that was discussed here with Morning is going to be my understanding incorporated in the new language that House Healthcare is working on. For that. Okay. Any other questions of Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner Fox, before we shift to Commissioner Baker, if he has anything he wants to weigh in on? Any further questions? If not, Commissioner Baker, I don't know how it's up to you. Uh, yeah. You're weighing Good in. Good Welcome. morning. For the, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I'm Jim Baker, the Interim Commissioner of Corrections. Uh, you know, the only thing I want to add, Madam Chair, is that, uh, you know, we fully at Corrections support the leadership role that Deputy Commissioner Fox has taken on this and uh, the work that was done. <clears throat> it, you know, just a general comment. Um, it, it's in such a challenging area with people that are, are ill, uh, it's exciting to see that um, this is getting the kind of recognition it needs inside the justice system. Um, I, I agree 100% with the deputy commissioner. These are civil rights issues. And you all know this because we've talked about this. We end up in situations with people that are in the custody of the commissioner of corrections um, that, that have not um, had the ability to get necessarily the kind of support they need because of the complications of their illness. And we do our level best to provide that. And I think we do a great job at it. But what, what causes me um, to be supportive of this process is I think we're gonna learn a lot about mental health care um, and folks that, that suffer from that illness. I think we're gonna learn a lot about it and it's gonna dictate for a long time the way the system is reshaped in the future to be able to support that population that end up in the justice system. So for me, corrections is all in. Uh, we have a role in this, but certainly mental health has the lead on it. And I, I think the way it was laid out in health committee yesterday around the time frame makes a lot of sense because I support what the deputy commissioner said as well. We can do a report, get it all done, nice little package for November, and it's gonna have no impact. 
Um, I, I think if we're serious about this and we're serious about taking care of, of, of uh, putting together a product that will have an impact, the only way to do it is, is move through the steps that the deputy commissioner described because it gives you the next, all right, which, which, which road do you go down next? And I think that that's an important piece for us to get, get a process in place in the state that advances our ability to be able to deal with um, folks that are afflicted with that, with the illness. That's, uh, that's, that's, we're, we're on board and uh, we'll support whatever we need to support. Okay, questions of the commissioner. So the other thing too that came up that Representative Lippert <clears throat> also mentioned, because this is such an in-depth uh, study and work group that they're really, we should be aware that they may need some resources, um, either financial resources, staff support. Um, so those conversations are happening uh, between Representative Lippert and Representative Grad that will then be reaching out to Representative Hooper and Appropriations Committee. Because this, if we want it done right, um, the feeling in healthcare is you need to um, give them the re proper resources to work with the department for that. Questions from the committee about the direction that we seem to be headed. Is there su general support for that direction? I know the language hasn't been out there yet. I know that they're working on it. Is there a general consensus about that direction? I'm sort of seeing some nods, yes. I think, so. I would say, I think so, but without seeing the language, it's hard to right. say for sure, but I, I'm really, the aha that I had yesterday from the testimony we received about that it was not just about a facility, but thinking more broadly about an approach. Um, I was encouraged and I'm encouraged this morning to hear from the deputy commissioner about, you know, that this is a model and we're looking at a systemic approach to this. So I'm supportive um, of this dire direction. I think it's improved for sure and look forward to seeing that language. Right. We may, there may be some language today. I'm not, I'm just not sure. I know Katie McClinn is doing the drafting and she is out straight with a lot of work. And um, so we're just waiting and that may not, due to her schedule, which is no fault of her own. She's just in all different directions because she's also staffing human services committees. So there's a lot of pressure on her to do some new drafts. So anything else before we finish up on this? Um, and then I'd like to take a break and come back at nine o'clock so we can shift gears to corrections. We're gonna be hearing Commissioner Baker from Kathy Fox with the UVM studies and um, talking about PRIN and the Urban Institute and all of the connections there. Were you aware of that? I think you were, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm aware of it, but I, I believe that um, I believe that uh, Chief Al Cormier is going to represent us, <clears throat> and uh, the project manager on print will be coming in. So I may I may I may get in as a spectator. I do have another commitment and another. Yeah, commitment. you can do your other commitment. You've got Al to cover, but I just wanted to make sure you knew. And uh, we're trying to. The goal of this is to really try to coordinate all of these moving pieces in DOC policy-wise, program-wise, initiatives, justice reinvestment, the Pew, um, Urban Institute, what UVM is doing with their prison research. So it all kind of coordinates and comes together to really lay the foundation for us to figure out how we move forward in, in our facilities, in our new facilities going forward. It's all interconnected. Yes. So anything else on the mental health issue, competency issue? Okay, thank you, Commissioner DOC. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner of Mental Health and Karen Barber as well, their legal counsel. Um, so we're gonna be taking a 10 minute break. We'll be coming back at uh, 10 o'clock.